joyous time in the hearts and the minds of many, many people. A king had been born. When God came to earth in the form of an infant child, the wise men came. They brought gifts. Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Expensive gifts that were befitting a king. Some children were asked, what gifts would you bring to Jesus? When our kids, you know, they always got a, a very fun perspective on life. Little seven-year-old Laurie said, I would bring him a friend because friends are fun to play with. We all like friends. Six-year-old Hunter must have a truly compassionate heart. He said, I would have brought a dog to Jesus because he needed protecting. And certainly, Jesus needed protecting from King Herod. But 11-year-old Perry, when asked what he would bring to Jesus, he said, I would give Jesus a lot of money, a big sheep, and a big balloon that says, It's a boy! <laughs> well, you know, Perry's not quite with everything there. But, you know, that's what kids would bring. What would you give to someone that you truly love? Last week, Tracy Barnes gave away something of immeasurable value. This is Tracy and Lanny Barnes, twin sisters from Durango, Colorado. And... Tracy and her sister competed on the Olympic team in 2006. They both were on the Olympic team, biathletes. They have a portion, a portion of their event that they're running, a portion of it where they're shooting small bore wrist, or pistols, or rather rifles. So it's competition, two different events that they're in. Here, Tracy team again, but uh, Lanny had been sick, and she didn't get to compete in the final qualifying event. And she wound up in 11th place. And only the top 10 qualifiers go to the Olympics. So Tracy, Tracy's going to the Olympics, but Lanny's going to stay home. And Tracy made the decision. She said, I think Lanny is a stronger competitor for the team. I think she gives the American team a better chance to do well in these Olympics. So she vacated her spot, which meant Lanny automatically moved on to the team. What's the value of being in the Olympics? They've both done it before. But Tracy still was willing to give this up. Because of the tremendous expense that's involved in going to Russia, because of the lack of hotel rooms, Tracy's going to stay at home. Cheer sister on. From 6,500 miles away there in Durango, Colorado. What are you willing to give to someone that you love? 
Last week we began our series of messages titled Giving to God. And last week we began as we discussed that topic about how we can give to God through prayer. Because when we give to God through prayer, we're giving Him our concerns, we're giving Him our time. Most importantly, we're giving our trust, the very thing that John was just talking about, trusting in the Lord. And it's important that we do that. So having that, that communication, that conversation, that relationship with God is essential for us. We can look at giving and we can say, God, you've given us everything. So what can I give you? Now, some people look at that, but some people, we, we seem maybe caught in that trap of, God, what can you give me? What are the things that, that, that I would like to have that would benefit me that, that you could provide? And sometimes it's almost like the, you know, wish on a star type thing that we're talking to God. We're saying, I need this, I need this, I want that. Rather than, God, you have blessed me mightily already. And it's not just us. Think about the apostles who walked with Jesus on a daily basis. Three years. And what happened? James and John, they go to Jesus. Hey, hey Jesus, Jesus. Hey, you know what? When, you, when you're in your glory, when you're in heaven, can, can we sit on your right and on your left? Can we do that? Because, you know, we've been working with you, been walking with you. It'd be cool for us to be right on your side there in heaven. You see, it wasn't about Jesus. It was about them. Here's a, here's a position of prominence. We're, we're going to be beside the king. When you're on your throne, we're going to be beside you. And people will look at us too. Now, certainly we're, we're secondary, but we're right beside you. You see, they're walking with him, but they still got caught up in the, what can you do for me? But Jesus, the master teacher, he, he taught them such a valuable lesson. A lesson that we still are learning over 2,000 years later. In the book of Mark, chapter 10... Verses 43 through 45, Jesus helps redirect them. He gives them something that's really more important, more valuable for them. As he comes to them, he said, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Now, we don't necessarily like that word servant, do we? We tend to think, I'd rather people serve me rather than me serving someone else. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. Oh, that's tough words. Servant, be a slave. Verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. What can we give to the one who gave so much for us Father today let us for these next few minutes give you our full attention let us give you our heart let's give you our ears let's give you our minds let's just simply give ourselves to you for these few minutes to hear the message to know how you're speaking to each of us individually because your message is never across the board for everyone each of us have a different need and you respond differently to us. So let us give just these few moments full attention to you, Father. Bless us now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. When we think about serving, and especially serving others on, on God's behalf, can lead to results that you and I can never imagine. We would never anticipate some of the things that might come from that. Let's drift back in time just a few weeks. Back in December, we had some of our church members who went to Smithville to Lighthouse Christian Camp. And they served at the boys' and the girls' Christmas parties on two separate Saturdays. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal for these kids and for the staff members there. But the kids have written some thank you letters. And we've got some folks who are going to come now and share what these kids had to say in response to the work that you did there. So, Gail, if you'll come forward, Lynn and Mark. We'll let a lady go first. This is from a little girl named Scarlett. This is from a little girl named Scarlett. This is from a little girl named Scarlett. 
Dear sponsor, first I'd like to say thank you for so much. I'm having so much fun today, and you're part of that reason. Now I get to give gifts to my family. I feel very blessed today. We get to hear the Christmas story later, Christmas caroling. My family is having a rough time right now, and you helped me be able to give, give to them. Thank you for so much again, and God bless you. Love, Scarlett. All right, this is from uh, Cheyenne. Dear sponsor, thank you for letting me come today. I had fun shopping for my family. I went shopping for my parents, sisters, brother, aunts, and cousins. This is my third year here at the Christmas party thing. I have went to camp for four years. The next things I get to do is Christmas caroling and hot chocolate. I made a few new friends. Thank you so very much. Love, your friend Cheyenne. Dear sponsor, thank you for letting me come to the Christmas party at Lighthouse Christian Camp. I liked everything, but my favorite was shopping for my family. I would not have been able to shop for my family if it wasn't for you. So thanks for letting me come. This is the best time I have in December, even on Christmas, because I don't feel as good as I do when I am shopping here. Thank you for everything. I had so much fun at the Christmas party. Another favorite thing we did was caroling. I liked when we go to sing a song using the bells. I also liked chapel. I loved everything, so thank you so much for letting me come here, shop, and learn more about Jesus. Chastity. See, you gave to the church, and the church bought several hundred dollars worth of gifts to take. And those were distributed, those were put out there. And we had people from the church who were going and doing the shopping. So you're serving. And we may not always think that our service is a really big deal. That's not impacting lives. But you hear just from these kids' perspectives how it did really make their Christmas complete. Doing something for other people. Our actions can be for one of two reasons. I mean, actually, everything is always driven by one of two reasons. First could be self-serving. The second is selfless serving. If someone says, well, okay, I want to become a pastor because there's these guys that are on TV. And they got the really nice suits. You got a nice suit, by the way, Wiley. <laughs> nice suit. They got these really nice suits and they get paid a lot of money and they got their own private jet and I want to be a pastor. You see, that's self-serving. Some people, they go into worship ministry because I want to be the one that when I'm singing, everybody's looking at me. Rather than saying, when I sing, I want to be a gift to God. So we could do that for self-serving reasons or we could do it through selfless serving. We have a choice every day, every action that we take. Now there's going to be an outcome based upon each of those. Either we're going to have... <laughs> an outcome where you sell yourself because it was about me it's about what I wanted what I wanted to get from this situation or you give yourself away our world teaches children even encourages adults to focus more on the self-serving things what's going to be the greatest for you what will get you the most in life so you get the most toys you get the most money you get whatever rather than selfless serving and there, there's so, I mean, certainly there's a lot of pastors that are on TV, churches that are prominently known around the country, and I certainly would never ever make the accusation that even the, a small number of those pastors are doing it for the selfish reasons. There's a minuscule number. Most of them are very selfless in their, their actions. They're doing this for God. But we have to then think about, okay, how do I avoid society's pull and focus on giving myself away? James and John, which motives do you think they had? Self-serving or selfless serving? I mean, these are guys who are walking with Jesus. If anyone got the message, you think they would get it. But they missed the point as well. 
But in the fifth chapter of Matthew, Jesus starts preparing his followers. In verse 11, he warns his disciples of what's ahead. He warns them that people are going to insult them and hurt them. That people will lie and say evil things about them simply because they follow Jesus. In verse 13, Jesus then encourages them because he knows if they're going to be selfless servants, if they give themselves away, they've got to be built back up because the world will tend to tear them down. In verse 13, he encourages them saying, you are the salt of the earth. In other words, you can make a change. You can change the, the complexion. You can change culture. You are the salt of the earth. Verse 14 provides them and us with a bigger picture of their role in God's plan. Verse 16, he then gives an agenda for today and tomorrow and the next day. Verse 14, please. You are the light that gives light to the world. Okay. So there's the background. He says, you are the light. You give light to the world. So you've got a purpose. That's to help others see through the darkness. Verse 16. You should be a light for other people. He says, live so that they will see you, the good things that you do. They see the good things that you do, John. They see the good things that you do, Mary. And what's the result? Yeah. They praise your Father in heaven. They don't say, Mary, you're so wonderful. Mary, you're so great. They, they may do that, but that's not why we do it. It's because we want them to praise our Father in heaven. So there's the goal. We want the selfless serve. We want to give ourselves away for that to be the outcome. Karen sang the beautiful song earlier titled, Less of Me. We sang a number of songs today about serving God, serving. The Good Shepherd tells us that if our focus is less of me, instead more on him, then there will be some good things come from that. We'll be a bright light in a dark world, giving ourselves away as we do good things that earns praise for our Father in heaven. During the last few months, we've talked a lot about mission opportunities and mission work. Whether it's going shopping for Lighthouse Christian Camp, going to Lighthouse Christian Camp and serving, whether it's working here at Lakeview Elementary with the number of the events that we've partnered with them on, whether it's building a wheelchair ramp, we give ourselves away when we are a light for other people. Today, you've had the opportunity to meet some of our special guests. Sandy Griffin, like I said, has been a friend of ours for several years. I've asked Sandy to come today, and she's brought some of her friends, friends that I'd like for us to get to know better right now, to understand lifestyle, but also understand mission opportunities that we have right here. As we've said before, missions is not always going to the other side of the globe. Someday, God may call us to that. But right now, we're here. We're here in the edge of Lake area, and God's saying there's mission work here where you can be the light of the world, where I will get the praise for what you do in my name. Sandy? Thank you. I've never used one of these before. <laughs> I used to be a speaker with Van. Uh, my name is Sandy Griffin, and I want to thank you for inviting me and my family here today. Uh, I'm here to introduce you to my mission work, to my heart, and the reason that I was put on this earth and the work that I was, I was put here to do for God. Um, as many of you have seen on any given night here in Nashville, there are homeless men and sometimes women and children sleeping on the streets, in doorways, or on park benches. Some staggering statistics, one in every 45 children in the U.S. are homeless this year, more than 1.6 million in the U.S. right now. Family homelessness is a fastest growing population. Right now there are 1,750,000 homeless people in the United States, the land of milk and honey. The number of Americans who live in hunger on the streets, 31,000 that don't get food daily. Let's bring this closer to home. Nashville's homeless situation has grown 18% over the past five years. The chronic homeless statistics are 20 to 30% higher than the national average. We are the buckle of the Bible Belt, and we're 30% higher than the United States. 
10% per of families here live below the poverty level. Jesus called us to be the hands and feet of Christ. We send people to Africa. We watch on TV from the comfort of our homes as we see another homeless die in the cold and we feel sad. We see people serve at the mission, at the holidays, and we smile. What a great thing it is. You talk to homeless and they say, where are these people during the year? They all come out at the same time, and they're all televised. There's mission work to be done in our own backyard. I supplied food for two years for a family in Franklin, Tennessee. He's a doctor. When the economy crashed, he was an MD, and people quit going there. He didn't want to do bioidentical hormones. He didn't want to do the weight loss shots because he couldn't sell himself out. I give them food. Nobody knows he lives right next door to a real well-known preacher who's on TV. And the preacher has no idea that this family with four kids don't have food in their refrigerator. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors. The Bible in James, it says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? We're so, we, we give the money, we stand back, we watch it. And another thing is, I've heard so many people, um, I have a nonprofit called Sharing Hearts, Joining Hands. My goal is to get everybody to work together eventually in some form to help this problem in Nashville. I became a 501c3 last month. We want to get them jobs, we want to get them educated, and the Bible says feed, clothe, and love them. The humanness in us says get them a job and get them an education. That's something we made up. Feed, clothe, and love them without judgment. We see people on the streets and we wonder why, um, if we're going to give them food, it looks like they're drinking. I'm not going to give them any money. If God's putting that nudge in you saying, give them money, he's telling you against better judgment when it doesn't make sense, are you going to do what I say or are you going to be the judge and jury? A great example I give is, you know, when you're working and on Fridays your boss comes up to you and says, you know what, I've noticed you've been spending money on pizza a lot and you've been eating a lot of fried food. Not only that, on payday you go out and have a glass of wine. I'm going to start giving you organic food instead. I'm not going to pay you in money because of what you might do with it. He doesn't say it to us and we shouldn't say it to them. When you see these people and God says give them money, even if you can tell they're drinking, you know what, they'll deal with God, but he's testing you. Are you becoming the judge? I have four of my dear, dear, dear friends with me today. Oh, I'm so glad you guys get to meet these guys. Okay, I'm going to start with Bob here. Bob came here. He, he started out in California. Um, his story, I'm going to have him tell you a little bit about his story. Bob is homeless. Bob had a wife and life was good. And do you want to share with them what happened? Probably about eight to ten years ago I lost my wife. She was only 37 years old. Uh, my life was really good at that time. But since I lost my wife, it all went sort of like downhill. Uh, things are getting better. I know I keep on asking the Lord, and it's getting better and better every day. I'm not happy where I'm being homeless, but I'm surviving with the help of you know my friends and Sandy and the churches. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have to remember that even on the streets and in jails, in the Bible. That's where God has people do their ministry work. So we're wondering why the homeless a lot of times are on the streets. And that may be where God chose them to be because that's where it's so needed. So this man has such a servant's heart that, and I'm sure you can feel his spirit. He's got the spirit of Christ on him. And I often wonder if maybe his role is to be Christ on the streets. And sometimes we think, but society says that's not right. But Christ says, yes, it is. The next one is John, gentle John. The first time I met him about four, 
four years ago, I think, right away I could feel the spirit of Jesus in him. And he, he witnesses to people, and he's got a gentle way. People aren't offended, and he calls them up on it about reading the Bible and living it. And he talks to them, brother, brother. He uses the word term brother, and you can feel it. I met John and instantly fell in love with his heart. And now John lives with me. John has a, a room at my house, and it's like having Jesus in the house. I can't, his presence, he's quiet. He sits and reads the Bible. He takes the dog for a walk. When I have clothes to bring places, I bring him all over. My car's filled. As soon as I go out in the garage, he's like, stay there, leave it there. What do you want? He puts it in the car. As soon as I come home, he runs out and gets it. He brings the garbage out. He brings it in. He makes my life so easy. I wouldn't think, wouldn't have thought I would have ever wanted that. It has been no adjustment having him in my house. It would break my heart if he ever left my house. John, tell me a little bit about your life. <coughs> Take a long time to tell about my life. But uh, Sandy is so, she's so great. She's my sister. You know, my true sister in the Lord. Uh, I was sleeping downtown. It's been, what, six months ago, I guess. And I... Uh, Got, I got COPD and I get wet, I get pneumonia real easy and one night it was raining about 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm in my tent, you know, and I'm getting soaked. It's coming in all over me. And I just started praying, Lord, I'm just so tired of this. I'm just so tired of this. Help me, you know. And the next two or three days later, Sandy said, won't you move in here? You know, God answers prayers. He does. All we got to do is just ask, and He will give, you know. But uh, so many years, I, I've traveled all over the United States, and I, I share Jesus wherever I go, because He is my Lord and Savior. And uh, it just comes a time when it's time to get in out of the weather, you know, and he, he brought me in out of the weather. He put me with my sister Sandy, and I love her so much. She's such a great woman. But anyway, I love Jesus, and I, I love y'all. What was amazing is this morning these other guys came and they had their, their bags and stuff like this, and they said, um, where should we put that? And to hear John say, just put him in my room. And I went, oh, that's just music to my heart, hearing him realize that he has a place there and he has a room. It, it's, uh, I just, there are no words. I mean, God is so good that the, he just he hasn't even made words for this. Jeffrey. I probably met Jeffrey four years ago also. And um, when I needed work done at the house, when all of a sudden there was problems with the plumbing, and I moved into a house that had a lot of, um, I had a lot of ups and downs and it needed a lot of work and didn't know how to do it. And Jeffrey, tell how you came into my life there. I just went over there and did what I had to do. I've been in construction all my life, having a hard time right now. Work a little here and there, just not enough. And I know Jesus is there, I know that. He's kept me here for something, so so many times I've come close to death. So I know he's there. But and, well, what's amazing about him too, I think, is that when he does the work, he doesn't just do the work. He could he could start at eight in the morning and eleven at night. He's a perfectionist with painting and fixing things. And he doesn't say a word, I'll go to bed shortly, I'll, I'll do it. Because for, at one point I had four guys staying at my house for 12 days in a row. And people have said, aren't you scared? You know what, God puts people in your life. No, I'm, I'm blessed by it, you know. So no, he's... And then I've got, you know what, I grew up in a family with 12 kids, and so I never consider myself a good cook. But cooking for these guys, I learned how to take anything that was in my refrigerator and stuff with my family. And I was able to cook and... and, and put love into it and we'd all sit around the table and break bread and there's nothing more intimate than sitting around your table and breaking bread. Now Wiley, I met Wiley in July. He had just come from, um, he'll tell you his story, he had just, he, he had just come from, from Knoxville. Clarksville. Clarksville. Okay, tell your story. Well, um, I was in, you know, Clarksville, um, down there. You know, I been homeless uh, in and out for, you know, just 
for a lot, a long time, many years, and um. So looking back on it, I see how God was working through people when I came to uh, back to Nashville. Um, I met Sandy by chance at this church where they were just, you know, feeding and um, and she, I was just asking her about work and you know, and she asked me what I've been doing and and so um, I kind of mentioned I worked in fast food or whatever. So she told me about this friend of hers that she knew that was starting this culinary arts program and um, for the homeless for the home for homeless men and stuff. So I got in contact with him and when I you know when I met him. I just started going to the restaurant, you know, um, kind of just, really I was just, because I never really did anything culinary in my life, really, so I was just kind of hanging out there, and then he brought me into the kitchen and, um, and you know, and started training me in the culinary arts thing, so, you know, Sandy and I just, <laughs> you know, we just became real good friends, you know, she has a, a very um, big heart, you know, for people, and uh, so, you know, I was listening to the message about, you know, serving because, you know, we, you know, we, we work there, but, um, you know, we get paid like, with, you know, he give us a place to live and, and clothes and stuff. And um, and so I just see the, you know, how, how people, how God uses different people to, um, to minister, you know, when you, when, and um, kind of, for me, it's you know it's a lot of been you know learning about myself, learning about the the difficulties that I was dealing with, uh, you know the um, disappointments, the the um, stuff from childhood, from even you know with family and stuff like that, and um, learning to trust God and stuff like that. And um, I heard a lot of people you know mention about this suit that I'm wearing, you know this this uh, um, a member in my church. She brought, it's another guy that's at the place, at the culinary arts place, and um, she asked her husband, you know, her husband asked her what she wanted for Christmas, and she said she wanted to buy us some clothes. So they was telling us about it, and, you know, I didn't think anything, like, you know, she took us out to Joseph A. Banks, and, I, and we were like, what? <laughs> you know, so, so I had just got this suit last Sunday at the church, they brought it to the church, and so I wore it today. And kind of, you know, it was like, <laughs> and Sandy had mentioned about, it's just it's kind of a coincidence that it, you know, it all happened like that. So uh, I'm just, you know, I just, I, I'm just grateful in the time I get a chance to, you know, tell people what God, you know, how God brought me from a uh, um, hopeless state. Because I was just, you know, my, my thing, you know, I was, to be honest, you know, I was just, and heavy addiction, and I just couldn't get my life together. No matter how hard I tried, and um, and through God using just various people, you know things just gotten a lot better. So, God bless y'all. Thank you for letting me share. These are God's poster children. These are the ones that He sang love when it doesn't make sense. These men have added so much to my life and to anyone that knows them, but I think we're so afraid of the person that we, we label as homeless that we stay away from them. We're afraid to meet their eyes. I'm just going to invite you, if you want to cook, if you want to get around a table and gather around a table with some of the men, we have 10,000 of them in Nashville. St. Louis, which is much bigger than here, has 1,500 because the city, the faith community, and the attorneys are working with them. We have 10,000 and we're the buckle of the Bible belt. It's embarrassing. And I think how sad that has to make God. That we, with all the churches, 700 churches here, and we have that many homeless. If you want to get inv involved, if you want to meet somewhere and sit around with a couple of the homeless like these men, I know them, so I would never put you around a table where, the, where there's danger, ever. And so if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you feel led to do that, I'm having people over my house tonight, I'm having a bunch of the homeless. If you ever want to do that, I'll invite you over to my homeless with some of the people because I bring them in my home. That's how much I trust them. I invite you all to, to come around my table sometime. I want all of you there. And I want you to look in their eyes and see them as people. I want to end this by saying there's one guy that was homeless that's now in a discipleship house and he writes poems. 
and this one is called No More Out of Place. When will the fog lift? When will the clouds break? When will the sunshine and the whole earth awake? How much time must pass amidst chaos and madness? I long for abundant days with praises and gladness. I'm tired of need. I'm tired of greed. I can't even help myself if I should bleed. And who would have been there when catastrophe is done, when I have nothing to offer? to give anyone. Only one can I look to for guidance and peace. He'll quiet the waters and make the storm cease. He'll cause me to rest safely secured by his grace. Then I'll finally be at home, no more out of place. Thank you so much for, thank you for inviting us. Yes, yes. We have, there, there's a lot of women, but we ha also have a lot more places where women can stay. We don't have as many places, and here the majority of people on the streets are men. So we don't have as many places. And um, as God works, I sold something on Craigslist in December, and I put $45, and somebody wrote, I'll give you 10 and I'm like, no. She said 12 and I'll come and get it right now. And I said, okay. I had other people that offered me 45 And I went, okay, I don't get this. I'm not telling anybody what I did. She came over. She happens to be a city councilwoman from my area. She's interested in homelessness. I met with her Monday at Starbucks. She was just finishing a meeting with a judge-elect. He said, sit down. I want to hear about it. They both said we want to be involved and I thought here the city that's been fighting us so I, so they listened to me when I said we changed in Nashville we changed all the benches last this year this last year we said we need new benches but what did they do they put benches with a bar in the middle so no one could lay down and then he asked me about when are when is the time when there's the fewest people on the streets needing food I said it's around the CMA and when there's anything big here because that's when your policemen put them in jail to get them off the streets. We don't have as much of a need for feeding then, and we can figure it on a calendar because you hide them. And he said, that's got to stop. I said, you're right. So they're willing to work with me. Just because of that $12 thing I sold that lady, it brought the city into it. Now we've got government, and I'm going, only God would do that. I mean, I walked out of there amazed, going, you go, God. I'm moving out of the way. And so I'm inviting all of you. Yes. Pardon me? Homeless mother and children is safe haven. Safe haven. And I can I can help you with that after. Huh? They have they, they, they're the only place that take whole families. They do. Oh, there's not enough? Okay, and, and you know what? If they don't have enough beds, see okay, this is our problem. If they don't have enough beds, we have no place to put them. We have no place to put them. Have you tried, well, mother and children, have you tried um, Hope Center, the women's rescue mission? They'll take you because they have beds. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so now listen. This is the real need. This is what's happening. We don't. You're right. Those are the two places we have. I mean, I got a call about a year, two years ago saying out in Jolton, and they said um, there's a family of, of, of five, three kids and uh, parents living in a car, and the kids go to school from there. Where can they go? We called Safe Haven, and they didn't have a place. What's really bad is each ministry knows what they're doing, but they don't know what the other ones are doing. So when they called me, I went, I don't know. And then I checked, called other places. Nobody knew. The name of my, my uh, nonprofit is Sharing Hearts, Joining Hands. It's to get everybody together now so we're all on the same page so we can combat this, this uh, disease that, that's infiltrated the buckle of the Bible Belt. If we can all work together, and like some people say, I'm afraid, I said, then do the cooking. Then do something. We need all of it. You can be the hands or the feet, or you can, be, you can do that. It's all needed. You don't have to do what you're, not, what you're afraid of. But if your fear is unfounded, maybe God's saying, get out, of it, get out of the box and get out of your comfort zone and find out you will love in a way you never knew you could love because you never tried it. Thank you so much. Guys, we certainly appreciate you being here today.
I can't imagine what it's like to sit in front of a, a group like this and say, you know, this is my life, this is where I've been, this is the, the things I've experienced. So thank you for your courage to do that. But I know that God has started to work in this church. I don't know exactly how it's going to look, but we're going to be doing some things to work with the homeless to help serve. Because that's what it's about. It's about giving yourself away. So whether it's that someone says, okay, I'll cook a pot of beans. Okay, if you don't want to take it to, to the bridge and serve it, well, we'll take it to one of the churches and we'll serve. You know, if you want to cook up some sandwiches or whatever it happens to be, if you're willing to go and help serve where other people have cooked it up, if you're willing to, I'm going to be talking with some other churches this week about room at the inn, where churches each night are providing places for homeless people to stay. And it's just simply saying, have, can we have some men who will stay one night out of the week? It may break it into two-hour, four-hour shifts, but what are you willing to give to someone because God has given so much for us. Jesus is the bread of life. He satisfies the deepest hunger we have, and that is for God. Jesus said, whoever drinks the cup I give him will never thirst again. And we thirst for the relationship that only he can offer. Jesus hung on the cross at Calvary, so we'd be freed from the prison of sin. His broken, lifeless body, naked, was then wrapped in burial cloths. So we'd be wrapped in the splendor of his forgiveness. If you could right now choose what people are going to put on your tombstone, it would be difficult maybe to sit down and write that out. Congressman Claude Pepper of Florida was once asked how he'd like to be remembered, and he replied, he loved God and people, and he sought to serve both. What more is there than that? To loving God, loving people, and serving both.